Thank you. Thank you very much. There is actually one more introduction that we need to do, Wendy. You are perfect in every way. You did, however, miss one introduction at our table, and that's uh, Ken Martin. Would you please stand up? A director of the Vancouver Board of Trade. So thank you so much, all of you, for coming today. And thank you, Dave, for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it very much. I would like to acknowledge as well, again, all of the caucus members, all of my caucus members and cabinet members who are here in the room with us today. Ian Black is also here, a BC Liberal caucus member today and a Board of Trade CEO very soon as well. Ian, I'm not glad you're here as well. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge all of you because you are the job creators in this country. I want to acknowledge all of you because it is not government that is the job creator. It is you. It is businesses. It is the private sector that creates jobs. <laughs> now, the Board of Trade is an important organization and a long-running organization, as Ian recently reminded me before he came to join you. My grandfather was a member of the trade delegation from this Board of Trade that went to Japan in 1954. And I found this wallet of his when I was cleaning out some boxes in my garage a few months ago. That's what I do on the weekends. He, he worked for a small business in BC. It was called Nelson Brothers Fisheries. He was their production manager. He worked his way up from being a fisherman out there on the boats. And he went on this trade mission with the Board of Trade. He flew through Anchorage, Alaska and went to Japan. And the whole point back then was to open up new markets and create new jobs right here in British Columbia. And I'm really proud that he did that. And that the Board of Trade back then had the foresight to understand that opening up markets is what creates jobs for British Columbia families right here at home. And I'm proud that he did that. He may never imagine that I would be standing here today talking to you about the same thing. That's new markets. That's new opportunities. It's good jobs for families. And think about what he did back then, what this Board of Trade did back in 1954. It was nine years after the end of World War II. Imagine how unknown Japan was in our part of the world back then. You couldn't get streaming news from Tokyo. You couldn't watch The Iron Chef on TV if you wanted to. But much more importantly, we couldn't have been there the way we have been to support Japan and the Japanese people as they work through their way, their way through the natural disasters they're recovering from now. Back then, Japan must have seemed almost like it was another planet. And today, they are BC's third biggest trading partner. And that shows how a determined effort and a clear vision can make a difference for the people of British Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to say this. My grandfather went to Japan with this Board of Trade in 1954. He went to open up new markets to create new jobs for British Columbians. And it's time to do it again. Now our plan, as you know, is called Canada Starts Here. We chose this name because British Columbia is the province, is the place that is going to pull Canada into the next century. We know we can lead this country like never before. It means that we can take the best of Canada and make it better right here on this country's west coast. Executing on this plan is my central mission as your Premier. Our plan is centered on bringing what we call that first new dollar here to British Columbia. That means bringing new investment here, 
so that new dollar can grow, so that it can multiply and circulate throughout the economy, circulate from that initial investment over to our value-added sectors, to small businesses, and finally find its way to rec rooms and ice rinks and dinner tables in every corner of this great province. Now, the plan is built on three pillars, and today I'd like to tell you about some of the key initiatives that we'll be implementing as part of it. The first pillar is job creation. Job creation with a common-sense government that opens doors instead of closing them. One that makes things simpler for business and getting out of the way when we can. Does that mean stripping back environmental and other social protections? Absolutely not. But it does mean taking a business-like approach focused on the end game, which is creating and defending jobs for British Columbia families. Our plan recognizes that sometimes government has to lead the way, but sometimes government has to get out of the way. So I'm announcing today that we will establish a major investments office. The office will help businesses who want to invest in BC get the answers that they need in a quick, clear way. The office will facilitate answers, it will make sure that there is no slippage in timelines, and it will negotiate the solutions to problems as they arise. If the answer is yes to investment, if the answer is yes to getting that business going, then let's make it happen, and let's make it happen as quickly as possible so that families in British Columbia can go to work every day. Now, I'm also announcing today that we will move aggressively to eliminate one of the big problems that inhibits job growth in our province, and that's the endless delays in permitting approvals. I have heard that from many in this room many, many times. We will invest $24 million across the Natural Resource Ministries over two years in order to eliminate the backlog in key authorizations that is preventing jobs from being created today. But let me stress, we are not changing environmental protections. And we are also going to add more resources to make sure that we continue to meet our legal obligations to First Nations and continue to involve them in economic benefits and the development that flows from it. We're going to take the time that we need to protect our clean air and water. But we are not going to leave investors hanging because the government makes laws and can't process the permits. I'm also announcing today that a new BC Jobs and Investment Board will be up and running within 60 days. It'll include citizens from all across the province to promote economic development by holding government's feet to the fire to make sure we're doing everything we possibly can to make BC competitive and not standing in the way of good jobs. BC will only win if we win together. And so this board will bring together business leaders, labor leaders, community leaders, and government to fight for jobs like never before. I'm also announcing the establishment of an Aboriginal Business and Investment Council to help connect First Nations with the capital that they need so that deals can get done and jobs can get created and everyone can benefit. And by 2015, we've set a goal to sign at least 10 new non-treaty economic development agreements with First Nations, which will further improve economic certainty. But this plan is not just about helping the Aboriginal communities, although it certainly is also about that. It is about helping all British Columbians and helping facilitate investment so that we can create jobs all across the province. Small business is a key driver of job growth, and it's the cornerstone of thousands of small communities. The potential of clean technology and the creative economy, of digital media and the arts to bolster our economy and enrich our lives are some of the reasons that I announced in Surrey yesterday three tax initiatives to help small businesses in those areas and many others. 
It will include a competitive re competitiveness review of business taxation to ensure that the film industry, which was, is so important in British Columbia, and others benefit from streamlined administration. Rich Coleman is here, and he'll, he'll tell you as well that we are going to do everything we can to make the most of BC's natural gas advantage. I will be our top salesperson as we grow new natural gas markets in Asia for BC. I will market this resource with a single-minded focus and promote the use of natural gas as a transportation fuel. We will take action to realize the potential of liquefied natural gas. As I announced in Prince Rupert on Monday, we will clear the way to secure the investment required to establish up to three LNG plants by 2020. Now we have enough electricity available to be able to launch the first two phases of the project. And I need to be here to clear to you today. We will not allow a lack of power supply to stand in the way of any further important steps in the LNG projects. Because earlier this week, I met with the leaders of the Heisla First Nation to talk about LNG. And they're pretty stoked about the opportunities that are there. Although they have a big problem in the Heisla. The LNG opportunity is going to create too many jobs for their people to work at. I think that's a problem that a lot of communities in British Columbia, large and small, would sure like to have. Now the second pillar of our jobs plan is about continuing to build smart infrastructure. And I don't just mean bricks and mortar, I mean people too. We need to support the human relationships that help us succeed, the unity we must foster, and the education we have to strengthen. And that's why earlier this week in Kamloops, I announced that the province is setting a very aggressive target to grow the international student population here by 50% in just the next four years. And our physical infrastructure is the start of a web that ties our country together and has for over a century in a very tangible way. Our ports do not just belong to British Columbia. They belong to Alberta, they belong to Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and further east. These ports belong to Canada. The workers that are building the Port Man Bridge know they aren't just building it for the lower mainland. They're building it too for families in Woodstock, Ontario, who are building cars and who need those parts from Asia. This coast is Canada's coast. And that's why I'm announcing today that we'll invest $50 million to improve the BC-owned rail corridor that connects Delta Port to Canada's transportation network. Now, with this contribution, the Port of Metro Vancouver can move forward with a $200 million expansion to increase container capacity, enabling the creation of over 600 jobs at port operations and ensuring goods move much more efficiently. This follows on my announcement from Monday in Prince Rupert that BC is committing $15 million toward the road rail corridor on Ridley Island. We'll also be thinning the border with the United States to help people and trade move more efficiency, efficiently. And we'll be consulting broadly and announcing further infrastructure investments in coming weeks. Many of them with our good partners in the federal government and all of them made with an eye to defending and creating jobs in communities across the province. Now the third pillar of our jobs plan is about opening up markets for BC goods. It's about doing what my grandfather did way back in 1954, but doing it today on a much larger scale and harnessing all of the strengths that BC has to offer. We'll focus especially on China and India, where economies are growing and the middle class is coming to the fore. The middle class in India alone is expected to be 10 times the size of Canada's entire population 
in just 20 years. We need to be great at understanding and expanding those markets so that we can produce the goods that they need to feed their appetite for growth. Opening up new markets for BC is key to our success and I intend to lead that effort personally. I intend to be the chief salesperson for our province as we take our historic place in leading this great country. Now by selling BC wood all over the world we've created a renaissance in the forest sector. 27 mills have opened in the last two years including one in Kitwanga. A sizable chunk of that mill sales will be going to China, Japan and Korea. And I was there when they opened the mill in Kitwanga and I have seen what an incredibly pos positive effect that's had on the community. There are 481 people who live there and that mill started with that first new dollar from overseas. It employs 45 of those people. And about three quarters of those employees are First Nations people. Those are real jobs for real families right here in British Columbia. And it shows the impact of focusing trade on trade with Asia and the power that trade can have all over our province in communities large and small. It also, by the way, shows the power of Pat Bell, our Minister of Jobs, and it's a great example of why I gave him this job in the first place. Thank you, Pat. Now, all over BC, we see examples of small business leveraging opportunities in Asia, too. We see the strength of our established community that has been deeply and intimately connected across the Pacific Ocean. Surrey-based, Jaj Lumber, just recently started shipping their first containers ever to Asia, to India, rather. And as many of you know, I'm going to increase that share by leading a trade mission to China and India in November so that I can make sure we are talking to the right people, we are finding the best ideas, and we are opening up and expanding markets for BC. We are launching an investor-focused international marketing campaign, and I will have a lot more to say about the specifics of that when I speak to the Business Council's Asia-Pacific Forum tomorrow. These three pillars, enabling job creation, building smart infrastructure, opening new markets, will stand on two key foundations. The first is a strong, skilled workforce, trained for the jobs that our economy needs today and in the future. And that means promoting education that will give our citizens the best chance possible to be able to find jobs when they finish their education and to make sure that our education system is meeting the needs of our economy. Allow them to find jobs in the communities if they choose to stay where they grew up keeping families together and building a stronger economy. It also means having an immigration system in place to support job creation. And that's why I support an increase to the number of applicants that we can accept through our provincial nominee program and we're working very hard with the federal government on any strategies we can to make, in, uh, to make immigration work better for British Columbia that we can identify. Now the second foundation is, is an important one. And it's an important one today, in particular, in troubled times. And that's preserving our government's hard-earned reputation for fiscal discipline. This foundation is so important because we cannot continue to be a safe harbor for international investment if we aren't prudent. We all feel a special pride in being Canadians. We are well thought of around the world for our diversity and for our tolerance, but Canada also has a hard-earned reputation for fiscal responsibility. And here in British Columbia, we take Canada's fiscal prudence and responsibility one step further through our commitment to low taxes and balanced budgets. Canada's debt-to-GDP ratio is 36%. Down south, by comparison, it's a whopping 72%. I'm proud to say that here in British Columbia, it's only 17.5%. That's one of the reasons we have a AAA credit rating in BC, and that's what I mean about taking the best of Canada and making it better. 
That's why we have to stick to our fiscally prudent course. We can't honestly say we're putting families first if we are saddling future generations with mountains of debt. High debt policies won't work for tomorrow and they won't work for today either. Go ask Greece. Go ask the European Union. Go ask anyone who lived through the 1990s right here in British Columbia. You'll notice that our BC Jobs Plan is not about figuring out how many tax dollars, how much of your money that we can spend. In fact, I would argue that the spending commitments we're making are actually pretty modest, and I'm proud of that. We're being smart and we're being strategic because I think taxpayers deserve respect. Our plan is premised on a focused pursuit, not of the dollars we already have, but of dollars out there in other economies. The focused pursuit of that first new dollar. So we've identified eight sectors where we think we have the greatest opportunity to bring that first new dollar into BC. The sectors are forestry, mining, natural gas, agri-foods, tourism, transportation, technology, including clean tech and the green economy, and international education. Now these are, three, these are sectors where our unique advantages, our creativity, our diversity, our resources, our geography, will put us on a path to success. And they're sectors that will lift our entire economy by helping businesses small and large and create jobs by creating the greatest number of spin-off opportunities. They were chosen because they are the ones that will drive export growth. And that means that everybody wins. And if you want to see how it works, take the example of little old Princeton which I used to visit every year when we would pile into the back of my dad's Rambler, all six of us from South Burnaby to go up to Anglican Church Camp in Sorrento. We would stop in Princeton every time on the way up to have pancakes. Now, that pancake restaurant in Princeton closed in 1996. But the town is booming again. And why is it booming? Because there's something called Copper Mountain in Princeton. Copper Mountain is a mine that has reopened because they have one contract with one company in one country in Asia. Copper Mountain is a small town. Not a lot of people live there. 10% of the population is directly employed at that mine now. Probably 20% when you count in direct jobs. And those are people who are now able, perhaps some of them for the first time, to buy a new truck to put a renovation in their kitchen. And maybe for some of them, it means that they're putting lunch in their child's lunch kit every single day that they go to school. That's the story of Princeton. And that's the story of Asia and the impact that it can have on a province like British Columbia. We need more Princetons. Now, I've told you a little bit about what we plan to do. And you can find a lot more details about it on the web because we've gone live now. But I want to talk to you a little bit about why we're doing it. Everything I have done since I became Premier six months ago has been about putting families first. That's families of all shapes and sizes. Families however you choose to define them. But families, for all of us, are defined by that group of support around us that love us and sustain us and help us get through the crises and celebrate the good things that happen in our lives. That's your family, however you define it. And the reason I care about families is because I care about creating good citizens. And families create good citizens. Families instill character in children. Families teach morals and ethics to their kids. And that's where good citizens begin. And good citizens build good neighborhoods. And good neighborhoods build great cities. And great cities are what builds a great country. We need good citizens. But what do you need to be a good parent? You need a lot of things, but perhaps the most important thing you need is you need to have a job. 
And all of you in this room, just like me, are in the business of creating good citizens. Because in the business of creating wealth, which is what you do every day, you're also in the business of creating jobs, which is an essential ingredient for building a great country. And that's why I believe a thriving private sector matters so much. Because a thriving private sector makes it possible to build great families and a great country. You also, by the way, make it possible for us to pay for all those services that make families healthy. The revenues from the things that you do pay for health care and education and the services that really matter to families all across the province and keep us healthy. Now you'll notice that our plan is about defending jobs and we have to work just as hard at that as we do at creating, at, as creating new ones. And that's important. Our province is a place of relative calm and stability. But we are surrounded in almost every corner of the world by economic turmoil. Today alone, we have seen a global market sell-off, a significant decline in our own currency, and escalating crisis in the Eurozone. Our best friend and our closest neighbour, the United States, is grappling with high unemployment and high debt. Even their own Treasury Secretary admits that they are questioning whether or not their political system can deal with the economic turmoil. I don't think I have to sugarcoat anything for the people in this room. There's tough sledding ahead for all of us. But we will not keep our heads above water by hunkering down. Our plan says the best offense is a good defense. In the 1990s, North America went un underwent a huge economic expansion. And I'm sorry to say that British Columbia sat it out. The government of the day raised taxes, they racked up debt, and they chased away investment. They killed jobs in every community by doing that. They pitted one British Columbian against another. They divided our society and the results were tragic. Businesses were lost. Families saw their dreams go up in smoke. 50,000 people fled the province in the last half of the 1990s to find opportunities elsewhere. And why did they leave? They left because they needed to work. They left because they needed jobs to care for their families. That was the better life that they were looking for and they had to look outside British Columbia to find it. Then in 2001, we started a decade of trying to catch up. In 2001, we turned the page and began to repair that damage and end those battles. We got our fiscal house in order by giving taxpayers the respect they deserve, by using proven economic fundamentals, by cutting taxes, by balancing budgets, and using a little common sense that turned out to go a long way. We saw our credit rating go up, we improved our quality of life, and suddenly we were able to start affording investments in health care and education that make this province such a great place to live. Well now, we are turning the page again. And we are going to build on that platform of the, next, of the last 10 years. We are going to pull British Columbia together as one team with one focus, and that's good jobs for BC families. Never forget the advantages that we have, advantages that make us unique. We have an incredible proximity to the biggest markets on the globe, to the fastest growing middle class in history, to the biggest urbanization ever undertaken in human history, and we are two, three days closer than any other port in North America. We have a diverse population. We have world-class infrastructure. We have sound fiscal fundamentals, and we have a wealth of inter, uh, intellectual and natural resources that the world is hungry for. We need to build on our position of strength, and never, never has this been more important than right now. I am a proud Canadian, and I'm even prouder because Cat BC is going to lead Canada into the next decade. We will invite our fellow Canadians to join us 
And we will tell the world together that Canada starts here. This is a unique moment in our history. It's a chance for us to do more than our fair share for Canada. To grasp BC's incredible opportunity and build an even greater country. Canada starts here because we are on the Pacific edge of this nation. We are literally facing Asia. Our, our location, our geography, our great assets. But that's just one part of the BC story. Diversity is at the core of who we are. Look around you. It's a key strength for our society and it enriches every one of our lives. From new Canadians to the strength and youth of our First Nations people to the people of Asia and Indian descent who've been settled here for more than a century. Our diverse population is a key asset to expanding our economy and to making sure BC families prosper. 40% of the people in Greater Vancouver identify themselves as Asian. And if you want to argue that there is an Asian city outside of Asia, Vancouver is that city. There has never been a place like this in the history of the world. And we have a plan to capitalize on those advantages. So today I've outlined the BC Jobs Plan. And that's what it has to be. It has to be a plan for our entire province. Not a plan for government. Not a plan for one party. A plan for all of us. A plan that brings us all together to move us forward. And that means we need to listen. As you know, I've been a big proponent of open government. And this jobs plan will be exhibit A of that commitment. If you visit the website bcjobsplan.ca, you'll see that the public engagement effort is already underway. We're also going to initiate regional and sectoral engagement all across the province with communities and chambers and everyday British Columbians. We'll be issuing semi-annual reports to tell you and them about our progress, but also to ensure we improve the plan by listening and taking what we've learned and using it to benefit the plan and the province. Now I'm doing this because I know government doesn't have all the answers. And we need your help. We don't create jobs. You do that. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic as we look toward tomorrow. I know that our province can lead this country, but only if we're at our best, if we're united, if we're optimistic, if we're confident. As I worked with our team to prepare this plan, I took my inspiration from this port of trade and from my grandfather and what they did so many years ago with that mission to Japan. They were writing the story of British Columbia back in 1954. And we're going to keep writing it today and tomorrow. We are facing a generational opportunity. We have a chance to lead Canada into the next century. This is our time. This is our chance to lead. This is our chance to take our place in confederation. This is our opportunity to give back to this country more than we take. It is our chance to introduce Asia to every single Canadian, no matter where they live across this land. It is our chance. It is our moment. This is our time. It's our time to say to Canada, Canada starts right here. Thank you very much.